Uh, this morning was really good. We got some, a lot of information that was going on. And, you know, I'm going to kind of take you back because um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context as far as what happened actually um, not too long ago. It's going to be six years now, uh, October 9th of 2017, when the fires hit our area. And it was one of those things, and, and I think you were going to ask me a question, but should I just go ahead and go ahead and ask me? Okay. We're, okay. we're, we're fireside okay. chatting here. Yeah, so, so this is a fireside chat. Let me just, I'll just do a little quick intro. Sorry, you guys. Um, so we were going to run this where I'm going to ask Judy a few questions, and then she'll have a few for me. I just want to add a couple things to the intro. So um, as I said, Elena Wall, I'm the... Um, Public Affairs Director for the Santa Rosa Service Area, but I'm also on the National Disaster Philanthropy Work Group. Um, I wanted to just expand on our intro just a tiny bit so you know why the two of us are up here in our format for today. So um, in my role, I am in the local um, Santa Rosa KP team, and we also do community benefit, community health in my team. And I was the, um, the lead for the North Bay Fire Recovery Strategy, which was a five-year investment strategy, and I'm on the um, Kaiser Permanente National Disaster Philanthropy Work Group. And then Judy was our local hospital CEO at the time of the Tubbs fire, and um, simultaneously while she led the evacuation of our hospital, her own home was at dan in, in danger. So I was going to run through a few questions that all direct to Judy, and then she has a few questions for me that are specific to disaster philanthropy, and then of course However, if you guys want to ask questions or you can give us the hook, whatever you want to do. So um, let me just start with Judy. If you could just share with us what was happening as the hospital leader and also simultaneously when your own home was being threatened. Okay, I will be happy to because it happened almost six years ago on October 9th. It actually started October 8th, but it came to me on October 9th. I was actually the administrator on call. And so I got a call around 1.15 in the morning from the emergency department, and they said, you know, something's going on. We don't really know. People are coming in with smoke inhalations and a couple burns. We're not really sure. I go, well, what? And they go, well, we don't know. I said, okay, you know what? I'll throw in my sweats, and I'll come in. In the meantime, I looked outside. I really didn't see anything in my neighborhood, and I live about eight minutes from the hospital. And it was very interesting because... In hindsight, had I known I was going to be up for three days straight in the same article of clothing, I probably would have chose something different. <laughs> At any rate, so I, my husband actually had just had knee surgery, and so he was downstairs with a total knee, and I went downstairs, and I said, you know, something's going on. I'm not really sure. I kind of smell smoke. I don't see anything. And literally, I said, I'm going to go into work. And he goes, okay, now, mind you, this is like 1.15 in the morning, so I'm dressed, and um, I look outside, and you cannot see a thing. The smoke was so dense from five minutes to ten minutes difference. It was so dense I couldn't see anything. I said, oh, my God, we've got to go. So I'm trying to get him out hobbling, and my next-door neighbor, Helen, rest her soul, had had a stroke and was a single lady, uh, very elderly, and I needed to get her out. I knew how important it was, and so... <laughs> I, I'm, he's on crutches, she's in a walker, and I'm yelling, you know, I need to get going. I don't know what's happening down by the hospital. And so by the time I got in the car, realized that the fences were all burning all around me. I couldn't see anything. If it wasn't for the flames, I would have never gotten to work. There's just no way. It was pitch black. And so my car kept hitting the curb as I'm getting down to the hospital. Everything around is burning. In fact, I have a, <laughs> my car goes stop and get out immediately. It's overheating. That's how hot it was. And so when they were talking earlier today about the wind, the wind was overwhelming. It was so windy. The embers were flying everywhere. At any rate, I get down to the hospital. I basically say to my husband, I realize you can't drive, but you need to get out of here. Take you and Helen, just go someplace and find a safe place. And so they left. And so uh, the hospital is right next to an uh, elderly complex, which is a mobile home, and it had a lot of seniors in it. And so little by little, it kept catching on fire and more and more and more. And so they actually had a volunteer uh, fire department there helping us because everybody else was, I mean, 
uh, somebody talked about you know the home structures as far as you know building for safety. At this point, they had every single fireman, policeman, all different places, and um, this is what we ended up. And they were wonderful volunteers. At any rate, we decided we'd into the hospital, and smoke is coming in, and it's just one of those things: do we evacuate or don't we evacuate? And the hospital was fairly full. It's now 2.15 in the morning, and we're sitting there with, who at that time was my partner, which was a, what they call physician-in-chief, and we also had the fire, I think he was the captain, if I remember correctly, and we're thinking the worst case scenario would be if we had to evacuate, but then even a worst case scenario would be if we didn't and we had some injured patients. The mobile home that was now totally up in flames was lapping against the garage, and I know that's where all my gases are kept. So if it would penetrate, even though it was down deep, five feet, and the cement all around it, if by any chance that happened, um, it would be an unbelievable disaster area. So we made the decision at 3.05 to start evacuating. Now the amazing thing is, and Elena will talk about the external community, but the internal community, first of all, before I even get to external, was amazing. Now, I have single moms, I have elderly employees, and it's like, do you need to go? Not one of them left. They all said, no, we're here to make this happen. So the, our critical care patients were um, immediately evacuated, and the community reacted like you wouldn't believe. You talk about resilience, <clears throat> the communication was down, the cell phones were down, the towers were down, really, really didn't know. But the ambulances showed up to take our critical care patients across the town to the neighboring hospital that was trauma center. We had moms that were in labor and delivery. We said, if you've just delivered your baby, uh, you feel free, to, you can go home. And it's like they all took advantage to go home. The moms that were in labor or pre-labor, the nurses put them in their cars and drove them across town so that they could deliver their babies. So it, everybody just jumped in to go ahead and do it. So then it didn't make any difference if you're a doctor or a nurse or you were the housekeeper or nutritional services at that time. Everybody chipped in. Little by little, we started to take the most sick patients down. And if you look down our corridors, we had rows and rows of beds and wheelchairs. So at that point, we had to figure out how many ambulances could we really get at that point. And so um, we got as many as we could. And then the transportation system said, what can we do to help? And we said, bring us buses. So we literally got whoever we could with the ambulances, and then we started to put patients in wheelchairs that were, were able to be in a wheelchair on the buses. Now, you, at this point, it's like um, for the Kaiser system, you're, you have a, a, when you're in a hospital, you have a wristband, and it's done by a name and a number. So literally, um, <laughs> it's really not HIPAA, compliant, but we took a cell phone and we start taking um, pictures of their wristbands because we needed to know who was leaving the hospital, who was in it, and who was going on the bus. And it was kind of a happenstance, but some of the individual elderly patients from the mobile home who are not our patients, not our members, hopped on the bus because they were getting out of town. And so... <laughs> Um, the, the community came together and just did an amazing job to get these people out. Um, I had, at that point, uh, 130 patients to evacuate. Um, and we actually closed the hospital within three hours. Now, mind you, I also had 146 from the nursing home patients that we had to get those members out to be taken care of. And... <laughs> Fortunately, Kaiser is in a fabulous system. You can call other, in other individual hospitals to say, can you start taking my patients? The closest hospital was in San Rafael. I happened to be in charge of that hospital too, so I said, no ands, ands or buts, these patients are coming to you. So they immediately set up a triage unit out there, and they got 85 patients <laughs> taken care of in a, in a mash tent, hot chocolate, hot coffee, whatever they could take, and then in the beds, and it was phenomenal what they did. And then if you were a little bit more critical, we sent you to San Francisco. So Vallejo, members were kind of all over the community. And then we kind of, we said, okay, they're all set. We sat back and we went, oh my gosh, this hospital is just full of smoke. What are we going to do? So that was like stage two. And um, if I can tell you that the community, you talk about resilience, the community was phenomenal. 
So now here we are. I, I don't know if this is my second or third question, but but we only have 10 minutes left. I could go on forever with this. But let me just tell you before I give it over to Elena, the community not only, okay, our doctors had no place to work. So what they did is we put them in a lot of the other areas. Some of the other physician offices said, said we have an empty room, come and see your patients here. Our, the people that were from the nursing homes, they had no medication. They had no, and they needed their medication. I mean, like that's a lifeline for them. So our doctors just kept writing prescriptions. The pharmacy in town said, send them all here, and we just paid for everything. And so it was pretty phenomenal. And I know you're going to ask me about what the CEOs did. Is that your next question? Well, so what I was going to say is while all of this. It's my fireside <clears throat> chat. Yeah, my fireside chat. While all of this is happening, Judy's own home burned. Oh, yeah. And we actually had um, over 200 physicians and staff who lost their homes that night while we evacuated the hospital. So it was really a tremendous effort through Judy's leadership and um, really showing up for the community. Oh, well, thank you. It was like, <laughs> it's true. I didn't even know for three days about my home, but at any rate, it was something that we had to do. The, um, I think the most outstanding thing is we have a CEO that was all over um, Kaiser Permanente at the time. He actually showed up within two and a half days, and he goes, show me around. And just showing him around, just the community, it was like shock and unbelievable as to how much devastation. The community lost 5,600 homes. Uh, that's a lot of homes, and about 40% were um, low income. So that really makes it difficult. So at any rate, the first words out of his mouth were, you know what, people can't work, they're all going to get paid. So everybody that couldn't come in, they had nobody to take care of, they were all being paid. So uh, just a tremendous amount. And then they just started to really work within the community to sort of figure out what would help. And so... I was very proud at that moment. Not only did we get the patients out, they were all safe. We figured out how to get them all back. We let their loved ones know where they were and how to get them back. And it took 17 days to open the hospital. And if you've ever, I don't know how many are here have to deal with California, Department of Public Health, DPH, oh my gosh, Oshpod. The rules, the laws, the regulations to set anything up was phenomenal. And we did it in 17 days, so... I don't know. It was uh, harrowing. It's hard to believe it's been six years almost. So at any rate, um, Elena. Yes, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> um, Kaiser is part of the fabric of the community. Tell us about the disaster philanthropy. Yeah, so um, my, my piece of the fireside chat is going to share a little bit about our philanthropy and the framework that we developed. And it was a five-year strategy. Um, when Judy mentioned our national CEO coming immediately to get eyes on the situation, that was the late Bernard Tyson. And if you followed his work, he um, really was a visionary around health equity and spoke a lot about um, the the size and scale of Kaiser Permanente and that social responsibility that comes with that. And I'll just um, say that through through him coming, through Judy influencing him to come get his own personal like firsthand experience, that's where we were able to draw those, those dollars to Sonoma County. And we ended up um, doing 24 million in grants, which is a lot for a business. We're not um, you know, a community foundation. And that was very much rooted in um, health equity, culturally responsive care, keeping um, the community at the center. And you know, we, of course, partnered with um, all kinds of large-scale organizations as well, government entities, elected officials. Ooh, my microphone was not close enough. Um, but really doing a lot of um, work with community influencers and making sure that um, our philanthropic investments were truly rooted in community and guided by those um, most impacted and that were most, most vulnerable. So for our five-year framework, um, the areas that we focused on were access to health, specifically mental health, like Lisa uh, mentioned, economic security, really in the first um, immediate response, of course, thinking about you know, vouchers for hotels, gas, uh, diapers, medication replacement, diabetic supplies. I mean, these are, any of you that are from a fire impacted community know that that's part of that um, immediate uh, unmet need. But then we also invested in community infrastructure. So we were looking at 
um, language um, ac access and language justice as an as a equity issue and making sure that communications were in various um, languages at the same rate and pace as English. And so for that 2 one one system that we bolstered, it's now over 160 um, languages is available. We also um, focused on really power building for these community-based nonprofits that were doing that grassroots engagement, community organizing, the promotores de salud, and then um, friar preparedness at a neighborhood level. So those were some of our investments. And then last um, but not least, we focused on housing. And so when you think about um, housing investments, we were looking at affordable housing specifically and just the pace of gentrification when there's a disaster. So when we talk about keeping um, equity at the center, what we've learned and what the data tells us is that there are winners and losers in a disaster. And oftentimes, people that already had wealth are on the winning side, and people who are disenfranchised or they're under-resourced, usually communities of color, end up on the losing side. And so a lot of the investments that Kaiser Permanente made were focused on um, what we called housing preservation, but it was actually rebuilding affordable housing to slow that gentrification. And we did that through some um, social impact loans, if you've heard about our Thriving Communities Fund, and then also through pre-development grants. So those are just a few um, examples. Can I just ask you a question? Yes, please. <laughs> um, Maui. Uh, Kaiser is pretty prominent in Hawaii and Maui, and so um, we we put together, you put together like a, a, a disaster playbook or something, didn't you? Was Maui able to use it? Yeah, thank you. thanks for asking that. So um, the National Disaster Philanthropy Work Group developed a handbook that's for all of our um, Kaiser Permanente areas. And then when there is a disaster, a nationally declared disaster, we're able to leverage those learnings and have ways that we, um, as an enterprise, activate. And I'll say in Maui, um, so I don't know if you guys are aware, but Kaiser Permanente actually has the state contract to run the hospital, uh, Maui Health. And then we also um, lost our Lahaina Clinic in the fire. So we sent two um, mobile vans and are doing on the ground um, clinical support to the community at large, not just to KP members. Um, we also have made, of course, a number of immediate grants and partnered with some of the, um, some of the organizations that are in the room today um, were some of the partners that are doing some of the work in Maui. And then also um, sending our own staff from across our various facilities to scale up our um, response, our health system response. You know, people always talk about the three T's, time, talent, and treasure. And Kaiser did all of that. They had used their time, their treasure, and their talent. So um, are they are we supposed to ask them if they want questions? Um, well, I, I have a question that oh, might, okay. apply, might open it up, which is, um, I mean, Kaiser is such an incredible organization and has a lot of institutional capacity and big spread. Is there a way that Kaiser supports or that your models might help smaller providers? I'm thinking of people in very rural communities. They might not have a Kaiser, but they have their local health practitioners. Is there a way to export the lessons learned, or is there um, tools that can go to those smaller, maybe independent uh, health care providers in those right. communities? While Elena is thinking about something, I will let you know that another disaster, and there's been several fires and floods in this area, but COVID hit. And at that time, that's kind of a different type of disaster. And what Kaiser did is we basically went out, and I was actually not even with Kaiser anymore, but I was with the, working with the county, and Kaiser sent out um, doctors to help, doctors in the community to sort of figure out what we would call the hidden figures. And the hidden figures are individuals that are in areas that I either they don't want uh, phones or Wi-Fi or they can't afford it. And we basically tried to figure out how to get these individuals in and to be seen, whether or not uh, you were a Kaiser member or not. So, Yeah, so I have a couple examples. Um, one is we participate in some of these um, giving circle talks. So for in Maui, we actually, and even though that is a KP footprint, but um, the... Um, they have a disaster philanthropy group that's been convened, and so they're having various speakers come and share best practices and learnings um, from community-centered philanthropy. And then also as an organization, I actually have some notes that I'll just look at. So we're involved in Doctors Without Borders, 
um, Relief International. We support Team Rubicon. I know they're here. Um, so there's a lot. And then we have the um, KP Cares corporate volunteerism. And that's really where we push in our own clinicians and frontline workers into these disaster environments, which is a, another way that we support. But we also support with our learnings, of course. Maybe we should open up for a couple questions. I know we're close to time, but um, do we have questions for our health care providers? Yes. So I think if I hear your question, I'll try to restate it. Your question is, what input would you have about retaining medical professionals in communities over the long term? Because you're seeing in some of these rural communities that post-fire, those professionals are leaving the area. Is that the question? The hospital itself, The right? hospitals themselves. Okay. Yeah, so I'll start, Judy, and then if you want to. So um, I was actually on a call with an assembly member. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you guys. You think I'm in public affairs. You'd think I'd have this down, but <laughs> don't, obviously. Um, I was just in a meeting with Assemblymember Wood um, on this topic, and um, I think what, what he was voicing was just the importance in um, having some variability in the regulations. So one of the things that's really challenging for small rural hospitals is the seismic, seismic um, infrastructure requirements and not having the... Um, the capital to make those changes. And so there, I think with those rural communities like Paradise, for example, Feather River Hospital, if I'm remembering correctly, um, if they didn't, if they don't have the size and that, that um, capital to invest in meeting the new regulations, it makes it really challenging. So it's, um, it's not so much um, a hospital business decision. Some of it has to do with the regulations. But Judy, go ahead and I know you'll have something. To no, say. we got the hook, honey. Oh, we did. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> okay. Thank you very All right. much. Thanks so much for that. <laughs>